I mean, you have these people that can just spout out the mouth these Bible verses, right, and pop them up all over their screen. They they are literally like robots. They just have that that intellectual knowledge of the word. They're like the Pharisees, you know. They know the laws. They know all the words of the Bible, but it is not written in their hearts because they continue in their filth and their wickedness. Thankfully, we see from the scripture that only God knows the heart of man, only he sees the heart, and only he knows the, the intricate details of my life. If she's wanting, wanting to know if I'm righteous um, before men, you know, well, you'd have to ask the people in my personal life. You can't just make an assessment from the other side of the computer screen. But if, if I'm righteous before God and in a, of my own standing, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not even one. If she's wanting to know if I'm good and then of my own standing, the Bible says there's no one good but God alone. But I know from the scripture that Jesus has made me righteous because I've come, I've placed my faith and trust in him, and that's a part of the gospel. Um, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So my faith in Jesus Christ makes me righteous according to the gospel. Um, Paul said, may I be found in him having a righteousness not of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness of God on the basis of faith. So I get righteousness on the basis of faith, not through the law. It's not a righteousness of my own through the law, through my own performance or my good behavior. It comes through believing in Jesus Christ and coming to him. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And when I realized I was an ungodly sinner and I needed to be made righteous and I needed to be saved, I came to Jesus. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And I believe him. I believe that when I came to him, he filled me up with his righteousness. And I believe that he that I shall never hunger for it again and I shall never thirst for it again. And I don't have to seek to establish my own. Um, Paul said about those who are trying to seek to establish their own righteousness, he said they're ignorant of God's righteousness. He said, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness or seeking to establish their own have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the scripture says those who are ignorant of God's righteousness are seeking to establish their own, and in doing so they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have been made righteous and the law has come to its end. You're not made righteous through the law, you never could be. Paul said, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. So righteousness doesn't come through the law. It comes through Jesus Christ and faith in him by which I live. I live by faith in Jesus Christ by how I'm made righteous. You can see how she was trying to make someone ashamed for quoting scripture. She was calling them a robot, trying to make them feel ashamed for quoting scripture and saying it's not in their heart. Um, the Bible says to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we don't study to show thyself approved unto men or people or daughter of virtue. We study to show thyself approved unto God as a workman need not be ashamed. So to be a workman, we study to show thyself approved unto God. You know, you don't just go out to be a workman and you haven't studied. That wouldn't make any sense. So. Um, don't let anyone ever shame you that you're studying the scripture. All scriptures, God breathed, profitable for correction, rebuke, and training in righteousness. And that's what we're uh, going through is scriptures that show how that person is actually made righteous. How a person is actually made righteous according to the scripture, and it's not a righteousness of their own. According to the gospel, an unrighteous person in and of their own standing can be made righteous right now by coming and putting their faith in Jesus Christ. He will fill them with his righteousness and they don't have to work for it in Romans chapter 4 verses 4 and 5 it says to the one who works it's not counted as favor but as wages do but to the one who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly his faith is accredited to righteousness 
So the one who's trying to work to get righteous under the law, they don't get righteous. They don't get favor. They get wages due. They, they owe something because only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. And if they are still under the law, they will be found guilty. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in the sight, for only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. So the ungodly, the unrighteous person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ, the once and for all, all sufficient, perfect sacrifice, is not only justified, but they're made righteous. To the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. So that's the gospel, is that a person is made righteous, their sins are forgiven, they're moved as far as the east is to the west by the blood of Christ, and he has made them righteous through his offering. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 says, By one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So by one offering, what Jesus did on the cross, he has perfected, made perfect those who are sanctified for all time, that is forever, an eternal declaration. So let's go ahead and get into this video and play pertinent parts where she rejects um, clear teachings of the Bible that we are made righteous in Jesus Christ on the basis of faith. Today to talk about righteousness and I want to um, just spread this word out. Now, the Lord has, has even told me in my, my heart that most people, if not all, who hear this message and don't believe that they need to be righteous in the eyes of the Lord, that they don't need to do good works. That they you see how she interjected, don't need to be made righteous in the eyes of the Lord and don't have to do good works. What she's suggesting is that you're made righteous through your good works. To the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. Not to the one who works. Remember, to the one who works, it's not counted as favor, but what is due. So what she's doing is she's denying the gospel because she doesn't know the gospel. The Bible says that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So if you're in Christ Jesus, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Your positional stance as a sinner is gone, and you have been crucified with Christ, and you are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He took on our sin, and then he gave us his righteousness. The denial of that leads to self-righteousness, and that's what she's teaching, and I've told her before, and she's still insisting on it. It don't need to continue in well-doing, um, they're not going to hear it because their ears are dull and um, that veil is over their heart because they have not crucified their flesh because there is some kind of sin in their life, whether it's secret sin or sin that they just do openly because... See, she's making the charge that uh, the believer hasn't crucified the flesh. They haven't been crucified. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. So as a believer, we have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So when he gave himself up for me, I received all things in him. He that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not freely with him give us all things? And so I received his righteousness. I received all things, including his righteousness. And it wasn't a righteousness of my own. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 30 says, by his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became from us from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and wisdom. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So I live continually by faith in the one who is righteous, knowing that I've been made righteous in him. And it's not a righteousness of my own. It's not something that I have to establish. Being ignorant of God's righteousness, I would be doing so. But knowing God's righteousness, I know I could never attain to that goal. 
I know that he has given me his righteousness on the basis of faith. So let's go on and continue to this. They don't believe you have to repent. Um, that they cannot overcome because they are still. So we see in the Old Testament, God repented over 40 different times. So the idea that repentance means you have to turn away from sin. Was God a sinner? No, God certainly was not a sinner. Uh, so she will keep laying in, you know, we have to repent. We have to repent. She's, she'll do this throughout the video. Um, what is repentance? You know, what is repentance for the person who comes to understand the gospel? Um, well, first of all, God grants repentance. The Bible says correct opponents with gentleness of God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been led captive by him to do his will. So repentance, according to the Bible, is coming to the knowledge of the truth and coming to your senses. It's coming to the knowledge of the truth. It's coming to your senses, which is which is a Greek word, metanoia. It's, it's a change of mind. That's what repentance is. So it's not keeping the law. It's not keeping the law. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified, for only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. So we're not made justified through our repentance. We're not saved through our repenting of sin. Still a slave to their sin. They are still servants to this world. And uh, it's a lot easier of a doctrine to just say, well, Jesus already did it for me, and and uh, I'm just made righteous in the eyes of the Lord while I continue doing wicked, wicked. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the self-righteous just do not like the gospel. It, what she's suggesting is that she herself isn't wicked before God in and of her own standing, and that she's good before God in and of her own standing. When when in and of our own standing, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not even one, that no one is good but God alone. That's why we need his righteousness. One who suggests that they don't need it and that they can establish their, it outside of Christ. Well, I don't need your righteousness, Jesus. I'm going to establish my own through my own obedience is rejecting the gospel. Deeds. And um, that is a, an absolute lie so th those people aren't going to hear me they're not going to hear me we i'm listening i'm listening to you I know that the lord even told jeremiah before he had him go out to tell these people to repent that they weren't going to hear him either and of course they mocked him they they had hate you mean like mocking me that I'm a robot when I quote scripture? <laughs> right. Hatred just grew up in them towards Jeremiah. And it's the same thing today when you speak. And she doesn't have hatreds towards me calling me that saying that. And, and she didn't say it outright or call my name. But I know she was talking about me when she said the Bible verses pop up and and then she said, they do this so they can go on in their wickedness and their filth, and they don't have the word of God in their heart. Now, does that sound like that this person has a lot of love for me? And the, No, it doesn't. It doesn't sound very loving. And it sounds like she has hatred in her heart. About forsaking your sin. When you speak about not being lovers of this world, it brews up that, that hatred in the children of the devil, people who are on their way to hell. So um, I'm still going to I'm still going to deliver this. But it's her that's setting her mind on things of this world. The scriptures that says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of this world, why do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not taste, do not handle, do not touch? What all what all have to do with things destined with to perish with the use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in a self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are to, of no value against fleshly indulgence. So you can see that's what she does. She has severe treatment of the body, self-abasement, 
Um, it's a self-made religion, according to the Bible. It has the appearance of wisdom. The scripture says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its way ends in death. And Paul called the law a ministry of death. So a person thinks, oh, if I have these commandments and these teachings and if I keep them and I'm obedient, I'll be made righteous and I'll save myself. That way seems right to a man, but that way ends in death through that uh, legalistic m uh, mind thinking. Unfortunately, she's severely been programmed by Chris Lasala, who is a not only is a woman abuser, but he's an abuser of the bride of Christ. So you can see when she tries to attack others that, oh, you know, you have to crucify the flesh. Well, she hasn't died to the elementary principles of this world, has she? But she's still submitting to decrees of do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. She has her young kid over there telling that she can't, he can't play any video games. He can't touch any video games. You know, she's, she's creating commandments that aren't biblical. Now, I'll just show you real quick. This is this is her young son. A young child explains why video games are satanic. Now, I don't play video games anymore. I used to play them a little bit, but my wife was so good at them that she used to beat me constantly, and they began, <laughs> they weren't any fun anymore. Even the gun games, the shooting games, which, you know, um, if we actually go out on a shooting range, I can shoot way better than my wife. But if you put a video game control in her hand, uh, she can wipe the floor with me. So the games didn't become any fun anymore. Uh, nonetheless, uh, she has this video of her son explaining, and, and she must have came to her son and say, are you going to continue on in that filth? Are you going to continue on in that vile sin of yours? And so she made him quit playing video games. Then she programmed him with the idea that, that demons are coming in through the playing of these video games. Now, this is a whole nother video that I was going to have my wife critique because she was seeing this and she was just like she couldn't believe the child abuse of this particular video this is this bit this is child abuse um, putting these commandments on children that god didn't even put on them. you know god sets us free from the law uh, acts chapter 13 says through him everyone who believes has been freed from all things through which they could not be freed from through the law of moses so not only has she not freed her son from the law of moses but she's actually creating commandments that moses and God didn't even bring. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. She's not only she's not only teaching this kid that demons come through these games, but she's teaching that you're made righteous by, you know, if you stop playing video games, you'll be made righteous. She, you know, if you start doing all these different commandments, the ones I make up even, then you'll become righteous. She's not teaching them that you become righteous when you come to Jesus, that God is so loving and kind to us that he gave us his son, and in giving us his son, he gave us his righteousness as well. So I'm going to get back to the other video. That's a message, though, because the Lord is just. He is a righteous, righteous judge, and he will use this. He will definitely use these words. So Now notice how she said, the Lord is a righteous, righteous judge. It doesn't matter what people say as far as lip service. If the Bible says they being ignorant of God's righteousness are seeking to establish their own, if you see somebody who is seeking to establish their own righteousness and then peddling it before people, that they'll be made righteous before God under their own efforts, then they are completely ignorant of God's righteousness, even if they give lip, lip service to God about his righteousness. They're still completely ignorant of it, according to Scripture. Being ignorant of God's righteousness, they're seeking to establish their own, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Um, you guys, we are in a time now, it is, this is no time to, to play around with your salvation. This is no time to mess around with your soul. You have to understand that in order to see the kingdom of heaven, you have to be righteous. You have to forsake your willful sin. See, this is about a righteousness of your own through the law, isn't it? It clearly is. She's just denying the gospel. It's common. People think that they're going to be made righteous through their own good behavior. That God's going to weigh the scales and balances and see that you have been a good person in and of your own standing. And then he's going to say, OK, you've done a great job. You know, I'm you know, I see you tried to keep the law the best you could. And so 
Now I'm going to let you into my kingdom. But by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. Not one single person will be justified in his sight through the law. So the scripture tells us that we're justified by faith. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, that they have a non-guilty verdict, that they're justified by faith apart from their performance to the law, apart from their obedience. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace toward God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells the believers that if you have faith, you've been justified. It's past tense. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace toward God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said about that peace that comes through that justification by faith. He said, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So he doesn't give as the world gives. He gives an, gives an eternal ongoing peace. And it's through faith in him that we're justified. So we remain justified forever. We don't have to let our hearts be troubled. We don't have to let them be afraid because he doesn't give as the world gives. Does he give to us? He is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him, the Bible says. He is our defense. He, he is there with the upright in heart. What does that mean? That means the, the repentant heart. That means that the heart that seeks to be holy and righteous. But see, if you've come to the Lord, you've been made holy and you have been made righteous. And the denial of that leads to unbelief and self-righteousness and self-efforts and works under the law to, to attain those things. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 says, By his will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, not through my efforts or your efforts, but through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been made holy once and for all. It's an eternal declaration. It's ongoing. And so it's eternal. It's not something we establish. It's something God established on the cross for us. And so the denial of that leads to the denial of the gospel and self-righteousness. And you can see what she said. I'm going to play it back again because she, you know, she appealed to being holy and she appealed to being made righteous. But a part of the gospel is that when we come to Jesus, he makes us righteous and he makes us holy. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So if you're in Christ Jesus, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Your unrighteousness has passed away, and you are now made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to go back and play that. The, the repentant heart, that means that the heart that seeks to be holy and righteous. Now, why is this being... See, the heart that seeks to be holy and made righteous, well... Those that have sought to do that and came to Jesus and have been made holy and been made righteous, the only one who would come to those people and deny that is the devil. The accuser of the brethren would come and deny the very fact of the work of Christ, which has made them righteous and which has made them holy. By his will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. If you deny that, then you're denying the work of Jesus Christ on the cross something that the enemy of the, our souls would want done. So go ahead and play the rest of this. Being called wicked. Why, is, why are people saying that, oh, if you desire to be like Jesus, you're self-righteous. <laughs> and you're being used by the devil. Like, why would Satan, why would Satan tell people to try to be like Jesus? That makes absolutely zero sense. It's the means by which you think you're going to be like Jesus. If you think you're going to be like Jesus by means of the flesh, those in the flesh cannot please God. Jesus was perfect. And the Bible says, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Do you think you're being made perfect in the flesh? So if you were being made perfect in the flesh, you, were be, you would be made like Jesus in the flesh. And the Bible doesn't say that we're being made perfect in the flesh. It says the opposite. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, do you think you're being made perfect in the flesh? Now, the scripture says we will be made like Jesus when we see him, but it's not going to be here on this earth that we're made like Jesus, but when we see him. 
says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not been made known yet what we shall be. But we know that when we shall see him, we shall be made like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has that hope in themselves purifies themselves, even as he is pure. So I have the hope that I will be made like him when I see him. And the Bible says that that purifies me, even as he is pure. That when I see him, I will be made like him, for I shall see him as he is. So we're not being made like him now. If we were, then we would be made perfect in the flesh. So that's what she's suggesting is that people are being made perfect in the flesh this side of heaven. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, it's a lot harder to give up the desires of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh, than it is to just to just fulfill the lusts of the flesh, right? We are called to be holy. We are called to be like our father's. You see, we're called to be holy, but if she's denying the fact that she's been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all, then she's denying the gospel. Now, our behavior is important in the expression of who Christ is, but our behavior doesn't make us a Christian. Our behavior is important for what is good for us and beneficial for us. Paul said, all things were lawful for me, but not all things are good for the building up of the call. So we have to look at things as what is good and what is bad for us. Not that we are under the law. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are good for the building up of the call. So when we're talking about grace and the gospel, it's not to say that behavior isn't important. It's important in the expression of who Christ is. But when you add it into the justification by faith or you add it into this is how you're made righteous or this is how you're made holy, you are pushing a false gospel and you believe that you're being saved and justified and made righteous by your works. A lot of these uh, cheap grace people, they love to, um, to quote this verse in Ephesians um, where it says, chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then they stop right there. They stop right there because they know they can't read verse 10 out loud, because if they read verse 10, it completely destroys their um, their their lie, their deception that they, they want to live in. In verse 10, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so it's simply not true that I would never address that verse. I've actually done videos on that particular verse. When I'm quoting a verse or anybody's quoting the verse, they eventually have to stop somewhere. Otherwise, they're going to continue quoting until they finish the whole Bible. So it's so just because someone stops somewhere at a verse doesn't mean that they are trying to hide from something. It's just that if you give that charge, you could always give the charge unless they just continue quoting the whole Bible and then don't finish uh, you know, saying what they're saying until they quote the whole Bible and then go back to the point. Um, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should work, walk in them. Now, there's a lot of different ways that people look at this verse, and I've addressed this verse. One way is we could look at this as um, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, that God has... Um, for the believer to go out and spread the gospel. And in doing so, they're doing a good work. Uh, but does that good work save us? Absolutely not. The Bible doesn't say that good works save us. Not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why we focus on Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 for you people, because you think you're saved by your works. But the way that I typically look at this verse and the way that I think this is biblically sound is that when Jesus was asked, what must we do to do the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in the one that he sent. So you can see the disciples, they have a question. They're collectively wondering, 
what must they do to do the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in the one that he sent. So when the Bible says we are God's handy, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, we walk by faith in Jesus Christ. We walk by faith in believing in him. And this, according to the Bible, according to Jesus, is the work of God. This is the work of God. We are God's workmanship. This is the work of God that you believe in the one that he sent. And so when we collectively believe in Jesus Christ, we are walking in the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And it's also a fact, according to the scripture, that Christ fulfilled the law perfectly. And so when you have faith in him and he is your life, you are walking in the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We don't walk in our works to be justified. We walk in the works of Christ to be justified. In Revelations, Jesus said, blessed are those who have my works and keeps them. So it's not about our works. It's about his works. Blessed are those who have my works and keeps them. Now, sometimes when I've explained this, people will get caught up on the plural of works when it says we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But if you consider the plural for the we, um, for we are, so that's we, it's talking about a collective group of people, are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for good works. So if each individual in a collective was believing on Jesus Christ, it collectively would be called works. Let me try to explain what I mean by this a little clearer. If I was the only person on the planet and Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in the one that he sent. And I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and I was the only person on the planet. Then it, the verse would go like this. For he is God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for good work, which God prepared beforehand that he should walk in it. But since we are a collective, it goes like this. And since we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the work of God that we believe on the one that he sent. The verse goes like this as a collective. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we walk by faith in Jesus Christ. And when Jesus said, this is the work of God that we believe in the one that he sent, this is the work of God that you believe in the one that he sent. When we do that collectively, we could call it works because it's plural then. They are doing the works of God. When you look at Christians, you could say they are doing the works of God. How are they doing the works of God? They are believing on the one that he sent. This is the work of God that you believe in the one that he sent. So if you ask a Christian, do you believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life? And they say, yeah. And then you ask another and he says, yeah then you have a plural context going on, which you could add the, the S at the end of it to works. Are, are you guys doing the works of God? And they say, yes, we're doing the works of God. We're believing on the one that he sent. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. So we walk by faith in Jesus Christ and not by looking to ourselves to see or whether or not we're saving ourselves through our good behavior, good performance, or, or our own righteousness. Workmanship. He does the work in us. When he sees our hearts have that desire to be holy, he does the work. He's the... There again, she denied the work of Jesus, that he has made us holy. So it's not about our works making us holy. And she keeps doing that. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. At least any man should boast. So we don't make our work to make ourselves righteous. We don't work to make ourselves holy. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we're made righteous. So the one who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. And we have been made holy through his sacrifice by which we believe in. By his will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So we have been made holy once and for all through his sacrifice. If you deny that, then you believe you're doing it on your own standing and you believe that you're using Jesus as a springboard, a personal stepping stone to establish your own righteousness and holiness 
before God, which is offensive. Even our righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. The prophet Isaiah tells us in chapter 64, verse 6, he says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. So all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And Jesus gave this warning in the book of Matthew. And it's chapter 22, verse 11, start there. But when the king came in and looked over the dinner guest, he saw a man there who was not dressed in a wedding in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without the wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness in a place where they'll be weeping and gnashing in teeth. So this person was thrown into a place where there was weeping and gnashing in teeth. He was thrown into outer darkness because he did not have the proper wedding garment. He was dressed in his own righteousness, which was filthy rags, and he wasn't dressed and clothed in the bride of Christ uh, clothing, which is the righteousness of Christ. You have to have the proper wedding dress to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have to be righteous, and you're not righteous in and of your own standing. You need the righteousness of Christ. And to have that, you need to stop striving under the law to believe that you're going to be made righteous through it and put your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. When you deny the gospel that Jesus Christ has made us righteous when we come to him and we believe in him, then you must believe that you're being made righteous through some other means. And there's no other means in reality that God would have provided except the law. And if it's the law, then it's not of faith. Paul said, if it's of grace, it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer of grace. So when you reject the doctrine that the Bible teaches that we've been made righteous in Jesus Christ by believing in him, and you believe that you're being made righteous on your own efforts, you will be the person that enters into the kingdom of heaven with filthy garments and filthy rags because you did not put your faith and trust and confidence in Jesus Christ and sought his righteousness, you were seeking your own. A master craftsman of our hearts. And you're right, we can't boast about any of this. We can't. You know, it, it, being righteous for Christ is not relying on your own self-righteousness. If anything, that's what you're doing you cheap gracers and easy believers, because you're saying that you're already righteous. So we, we are righteous already righteous in Jesus Christ. And if you deny that, then you are leaning to self-righteousness because you're saying that you're going to get righteous by self and not righteous through Christ. These people don't understand how offensive it is to God to call his grace cheap. The grace of God that provided us the forgiveness of sins and, and the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus came at the most expensive price that the universe could provide, and that was the blood of Christ. There was nothing more expensive. There's no higher price paid than that which came through the blood of Christ than to call it cheap, to call, call God's grace cheap, and to go back to the law as you do. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. So you nullify the grace of God by calling it cheap and going back to the law and believing that you're going to be made righteous through it. You don't understand how offensive that is to a holy God who has provided his son to sinners who could never save themselves, who are unrighteous in and of their own standing, but God has made them righteous through the blood and death and sacrifice of his son. And you use his son as a springboard to try to make yourself look holy and righteous in and of your own standing before people. And you do it to sacrifice the gospel. And in doing so, you sacrifice the gospel. Jesus came to call the sinners to repentance, right? He did not call the people who have no need for repentance. Because if you're already righteous by what Jesus did, then why do you need to repent? You know? Um, so what she's saying is, if you're already righteous by what Jesus did, why, why would you have to repent? In other words, why would you have to keep the law? 
well, we don't have a relationship to the law anymore. And if you were studying to show thyself approved unto God as to be a workman to do this kind of thing, then you would see that the Bible says, through him, everyone who believes has been freed from all things through which they could not be freed from through the law of Moses. The scripture says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Scripture tells us in Romans, likewise, brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be joined to another, that who is him who has been raised from the dead in order that you might bear fruit to God. So we have died to the law. The law has come to its end. We have been freed from the law. And the scripture tells us we're not under the law. The Bible says the law was a schoolmaster, a tutor to lead us to faith in Christ. But once faith has come, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. So we're no longer under the law, which was the schoolmaster that led us to faith in Christ, by which we were made righteous and we were justified. And it wasn't by working under the law. To the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. These people claim to love God, but they hate his gospel. These people claim to love righteousness, but they hate the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. These people claim to be obedient, yet the scripture says you were obedient from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So they weren't obedient from the heart, otherwise they would know that when they believe unto Lord Jesus Christ, they are made righteous. They weren't obedient to that form of doctrine which was delivered, they were disobedient to it. And they think that they're being made righteous through their own obedience the scripture says just as through one man's disobedience many were made sinners even so through the one man's obedience many are made righteous so they believe they're being made righteous through their obedience but the scripture and the gospel tells us that we're made righteous through the one man's obedience through the one man's obedience many are made righteous and when you deny that we're made righteous through the one man's obedience and believing that you're being made righteous through your own obedience, you're nullifying the grace of God. So it's not that we call grace cheap or that we think grace is cheap. It's that you are calling grace cheap. You are saying that God's grace is cheap because God gives it freely. The wages of sin, but, but the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But because you don't like the idea that it's free, you call it cheap. Well, it, if if cheap is free, like if I went to a fruit stand and I said, uh, how much uh, is this tomato here? And they said, oh, it's free. I could say, well, that's even that's even better than cheap, because at least if it was cheap, I would have to pay a dollar. I'd have to pay maybe 50 cents. But the fact that it's free, it's even it's it's even better than cheap. There's, it's, I don't have to even pay one cent for this. So what it is is that you people hate the grace of God, you despise the grace of God, and you despise God's Son and His righteousness and the work of the cross. May I never boast except in the cross of Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And in that crucifying of Jesus Christ by that one offering, I was made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all according to the Scriptures. And you to call that cheap, for you to, to blaspheme God and your arrogance and your own self-righteousness shows that you're ignorant of God's righteousness. So you call God's grace cheap while God calls his grace free. The Spirit says come, the bride says come, let him who hears come and let him who wishes come and drink freely of the water of life without cost. So you call God's grace cheap, but God calls his grace free, and that one can come and drink freely of the water of life without cost. When you insult the grace of God, you do it to your own pride and arrogance and your own self-righteousness. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Those who realize that in and of their own standing, they can never be righteous. They can never save themselves, but they came to the one and only true God who can and who has promised eternal life before the ages began to those who put their faith and they trust in him and him alone. We are the true circumcision who take no confidence in the flesh, but we boast in Christ Jesus and worship God in the spirit. If there's one thing that you can pull away from this video that you watched of hers, it's about taking confidence in the flesh. And she's not boasting in Christ Jesus that he is her righteousness, is she? 
she's casting it off. She's throwing it. She's throwing the righteousness of Christ aside in his garment as though it was some filthy rag as she tries to establish her own. So you can see that in this, uh, Christ was not her boasting at all. She did not boast that Christ was her righteousness. But ta Paul tells us believers that we are the true circumcision who take no confidence in the flesh. So the true circumcision takes no confidence in the flesh. The false circumcision obviously will. The true circumcision who takes no confidence in the flesh, but we boast in Christ Jesus. So our boasting, our glorying is in Christ Jesus. And those that glory in the flesh, they cannot please God. And so unfortunately, I hope that God grants her repentance. Um, which is coming to the knowledge of the truth, which is coming to the, her senses. Uh, correct opponents with gentleness of God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been led captive by him to do his will. So I hope she comes to her senses. I hope she comes to the knowledge of the truth. And I pray and hope that God makes his word effective to that means for her. Um, is your word, O Lord, not like the hammer that breaks the rock? And I pray that your word, O oh Lord, will break the hardened rock of her heart and that she would believe unto you, unto righteousness, and would accept that free offer of salvation, that free gift that she's been calling cheap for so long. God bless, guys. Peace to you. Take care. I hope your day is going good.